to be here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the Mod and Code project, um, and the title is to uh, the title is to to warn you that this is a bit of a war is a bit of a war story, and there will be some casualties along the way. Um, so uh, Mod and Code is a um, uh, project that uh, has been going on for about five years and is just winding down this year. Uh, it's the equivalent of the Human ENCODE project, Encyclopedia of uh, Functional Elements, but it's applied to uh, the worm and the fly genomes, those uh, popular model organisms. And, and essentially, um, it's a uh, multi, it's it's a multi-dimensional functional data set in which uh, across a series of uh, developmental time points, phenotypes, pharmacological interventions, uh, mutants, cell lines in both the worm and, and uh, both the fly shown here and the worm, uh, a group of 10 laboratories from uh, around North America are characterizing uh, all the uh, all the functional genomic elements and uh, using a variety of techniques. One is RNA se sequencing uh, the organism uh, to saturation to identify all transcribed units, alternative splicing expression patterns across these many stages and uh, developmental time points. A series of experiments to identify the location and timing of uh, origins of replication to find uh, early and late uh, replicating portions of the genome and to determine the regulation of this. Uh, a series of experiments using uh, chip, uh, chip chip and chip sequencing, chromatin IP, to identify the location and timing of modified uh, histone, uh, histone areas, uh, as well as Chip chip and chip seek using transcription factors and chromatin uh, modifying uh, enzymes to identify where transcription factors are binding and, and when under a variety of conditions. And so I, I'm going to, there, there's some good and bad aspects of this project. I'm going to talk about the good stuff first. And then we're going to get increasingly uh, ugly as we go as we go across. So the 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 best part of the project is the is the excellent science. So um, just coming on uh, two years ago at, at the project's uh, uh, three quarters point, um, there were a, a series of two major papers in science: one for worm and one for fly, and then a a small flotilla of about 30 companion papers in Nature and Genome Research and uh, some other high-impact journals describing the findings from this, uh, uh, from this project. And I'm going to give you just kind of highlights from some of the things that were found. So first of all is a extremely deep data set of the uh, of, uh, of, uh, chromatin IP from all the major histone marks uh, the presence of alternative histones, uh, histone modifying factors across multiple stages and strains. And what this enabled was the, the, uh, the generation of predictive models of chromatin state. So given a, seri given, uh, a series of, uh, uh, of, chrome, uh, of histone modification marks, um, the uh, group developed models which allowed you to predict what the state of the chromatin was underneath that place. Uh, proximal promoters, distal enhancers, insulating elements, actively transcribed genes, silenced genes, origins of replication. Uh, the model is the model, the predictive model is incredibly uh, good. And what I'm showing here is just one of the uh, one of the figures out of the Drosophila science paper uh, showing that you can combine a series of histone, of histone marks and predict promoters extremely well, transcripts extremely well, and they're supported by experimental confirmation from the RNA sequencing data. I'll show you a little bit more of this later. Uh, another big aspect of the project was the uh, identification of, trans, of transcription, the transcription factor regulatory uh, combinatorial code. 
Um, there, uh, with roughly, at the, at the midpoint of the project, roughly 30 transcription factors in worm, uh, uh, about 60 in fly, um, that number has gone way up now. It's, a, it's in the hundreds for both of them, and that data is about to be published. But the, the big surprise that came out of this work was the, uh, uh, was the presence of these uh, so-called hot regions, or high occupancy uh, uh, transcription factor binding sites. Uh, about half of the genome, uh, uh, half of the transcription factor binding sites are, are, are highly specific. Here we're looking at a small region of the genome in, uh, uh, in, in uh, C. elegans, uh, and uh, we're looking at a series of transcription factor binding, uh, binding site profiles here. And a number of the sites are very specific, where there's only one or maybe a few uh, specific transcription factors binding to it, which is kind of the, the, the model we've all had about uh, one transcription factor binds and upregulates another, upregulates a downstream gene. However, another half of the transcription factor binding sites are these promiscuous things called hot regions, with ba basically um, a lot of transcription, the majority of transcription factors bind to them. They kind of line up. They look like an artifact at first. It turns out um, uh, they're not they're not an artifact. They're a distinct type of binding site. This is a uh, kind of histogram of the uh, uh, of of the uh, the fraction of binding sites uh, against the number of transcription factors that bind to them. And if you kind of arbitrarily take uh, the definition of a hot region as regions to which ten or more uh, transcription factors bind. It's about 50% of, of the binding sites, so not an insignificant number. These hot regions have a very um, distinct um, profile, however, from the more conventional, unique, low-complexity transcription factor binding sites. They're characterized by, uh, um, uh, so here again, we're looking at transcriptional factor complexity going this way, so hot regions are on this side, unique regions are on that side. They're characterized by uh, uh, open chromatin, uh, kind of a deficiency in, uh, in uh, activating, histo activating marks, um, and a big deficiency in classical enhancers. And, and basically what the story, the story is that these are, perhaps, these are, are sites of the, um, uh, sites of the chromatin which are, which are open, are devoid, relatively devoid of regulatory elements. Um, a lot of transcription factors are binding, binding to them. We don't know what they do, and one theory is that they're serving kind of as a, as a buffer for transcription factors. It's where transcription factors go when they're not doing anything. They just kind of, they just reside in there. Another is it's, uh, is they're, they're a structural, uncharacterized structural element. Some of them, however, are associated with with regulatory activity. So um, if you look at the correlation between occupancy of bindings of hot sites and transcription, uh, uh, often you see nothing, but sometimes you see, you see regulatory activity. So they're not to be written off. So that was an interesting, intriguing finding. Uh, from, this, from this type of data, we could build up these uh, chromatin state models. This is just a, a view of the um, a modern code genome browser showing the chromatin, the integrated chromatin state uh, track. What we're seeing here is in fly uh, a series of a series of annotated genes. Here's the raw data on uh, on histone marks with uh, peaks being uh, peaks being called here, and you can integrate these all together into a very concise summary of uh, nine different chromatin states each one color-coded. As you mouse over them in the browser, it shows you what that state corresponds to. Here we're seeing a predicted promoter, and typically they line up very well with the annotate, with uh, annotated promoters and enhancers. So that is a, uh, and there's a different track for each developmental, developmental stage. So you really can get a very good view of what's happening in the genome uh, across the, the across uh, development and phenotypic differentiation. Another thing that came out of the, another highlight of the project was the ability to predict the expression level of genes. 
just from the combination of histone marks and transcription factors. Now, this is the model is the model is quite good. Uh, here's what the, the the model predicts. Here's the observed expression from RNA tiling array and RNA seq. It's really really quite predictive. One thing you have to remember is that a, a poly polymerase A binding goes into the model, so maybe that's cheating a little bit. And of course, the histone marks themselves are a lot of them are the consequence of active transcription rather than the cause. It would be great if you could just do this with the transcription factors, but um, it's only uh, it, at the time this was published, there are only um, uh, less than 10% of the transcription factors were, were examined. But it gives you a gives you a kind of a, uh, uh, gives you an idea of what 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 what's possible with the data set. Uh, from the transcription factor uh, binding data and uh, microRNA uh, sequencing and binding site characterization, the worm and the fly analysis groups were able to build up these regulatory maps. This is uh, uh, another display that um, uh, the, the uh, data coordinating center developed for the project where um, there are transcription factors and their regulatory relationships and microRNAs here. As you mouse over different parts of it, uh, it highlights the, the, the positive and negative regulatory relationships and lets you explore into it deeply. This is actually using um, Gary Bader's uh, Cytoscape uh, web software, which is a wonderful piece of, piece of software as a display. Um, and then, sort of as a as a measure of um, how of the coverage of the modern code project, uh, we looked at how much of the evolutionarily constrained genome was covered by the various annotated elements. So what I'm here I'm showing uh, showing worm, but we did a similar analysis in C. elegans. So um, in C. elegans, about half the bases in C. elegans are under purifying selection. So we believe there's a functional element of that. And using the combination of modern code uh, annotated elements, coding regions, transcription factor binding sites, uh, areas of chromatin interaction, uh, we're able to explain uh, roughly 80% of the evolutionarily constrained genome. This complicated looking thing is showing that some types of elements are more constrained than others. The big peak here is from coding regions. Transcription factors have a, uh, uh, um, are, are also evolutionarily constrained, but less so. And there's a lot of information embedded in that. Okay. And then uh, since, since the publication, uh, the data sets have, have grown. Um, but the, and uh, there's going to be another series of publications coming out in uh, uh, early 2013. The highlight of this is going to be comparative functional genomics between worm fly on the one hand and between the, those two invertebrates and human and mouse on the other using the ENCODE data sets. This is probably the most surprising and intriguing thing that's come out of this cross-species comparison so far. It's unpublished data from um, uh, Peter Bickel and uh, Steve Brenner's labs at Berkeley. Um, what they did here is to take uh, ortholog, one-to-one uh, -one orthologs in fly and worm, fly along this way and worm along that way, and compare their RNA expression patterns at each of the defined developmental stages to see if there's any correlation in when particular genes are being expressed. And most people, myself included, thought that this was garbage. There was no way you were going to find orthologous developmental stages between two organisms that were, are so separated in evolutionary time. It turns out that that's not true. Early embryo in worm uh, lines up very nicely with early embryo in fly. Uh, later embryo in worm lines up well later embryo in fly. In fact, you get a diagonal here all the way up to the, um, uh, the uh, larval stages in, uh, uh, in uh, worm and fly. And then it starts to get very, very interesting. 
Uh, it turns out that the pupil stages in, uh, in fly, which has no obvious ortholog in, uh, to development in worm, uh, lines up very well with kind of early um, uh, uh, L1 early larva. So we see a, a kind of a duplication of the developmental time course, crime course here. Adults line up with adults pretty well. And then there's another stage in worm, the dower stage, which has no equivalent in, in, in uh, fly. That lines up pretty well with L1 larva in fly. So what this means, we don't know, but it's a really striking, it's a really striking, interesting finding. So now I'm going to get into the, to the war story part of the project. So my group's role in this project was to run the data coordinating center, which turned out to be a tremendous challenge. Ten different groups working on these very complex data sets, uh, submitting data, and our job was to organize it and get it out to the get it out to the community in a timely fashion. And the problem with this kind with the modern code data is first of all, there's lots of it. There's currently about 10 terabytes of data, including all the sequencing data. And it's very, very diverse. It's a very uh, complex data set associated with lots of metadata. And we were always under the gun to get it out qu quick, uh, get it out quickly. And when we um, uh, if we fell behind, we would get lots of complaints, both from the user community, when's the data coming out, and from the data providers. I want to publish my paper now. Why isn't it, why isn't it uh, out on the website? And our challenges were really to capture the experimental protocols in, 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 in detail. There are, uh, these are multi-step, complicated uh, wet laboratory protocols. There are complex analytic protocols, lots of intermediate data files which are of interest to people. And we felt it was important in a, in a, in a, in a big project of this sort is to capture everything, uh, both the data and the protocols necessary to reproduce the results, to enforce consistency and completeness, to uh, enforce uh, the, uh, the consortium's own quality control and quality insurance checks, uh, and then publish it to the community in a number of, in a number of useful ways, and to do it in a, in, a, in a prompt fashion. And to a greater or lesser, sometimes we succeeded and sometimes we failed. So the, uh, we developed a, uh, um, a combination of human curation and machine curation to make this possible. The basic, basically the way we would do this is at the beginning uh, of, uh, during the first uh, year and a half of the project, we had lots of discussions with the, the wet labs to develop a, uh, a template for submitting their data, data to us. Uh, we then developed a, uh, a software system that allowed people to upload their data sets uh, uh, according uh, with the uh, filled out uh, submission form, the same submission template that we had agreed on with them. Uh, to, to run a series of, of automatic uh, QC checks on the data. Are all the fields filled out? Are all the files there that we expect to see? And then to have a manual review step. Uh, and then if everything passes, we then release it to, to a, a, variety of, uh, a variety of sources. Um, the, the big challenge, the, one of the, the big issues was to capture the laboratory protocols. And what we what we did is to create a com, uh, to uh, create a uh, uh, a system in which every protocol and every reagent was described by a human readable wiki page. Uh, so, for example, for um, here's an example of an RNA sequence alignment uh, step used by uh, one of the one of the laboratories. And they describe in, 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 in kind of a, a protocols fashion uh, how, what software they run to do this alignment step. And then all the steps downstream of that, including the wet lab steps, the, the uh, RNA, ex the extraction, growing the organisms, the upstream steps uh, are all described in the same, in the same way. We similarly had a, a wiki page for each reagent. This is describing a, a antibody against the H4 histone, 
and it has a free text area and a kind of a, a template area where we have some controlled vocabulary, some structure. So we required each laboratory, before they were to begin setting the, sending us data, to describe their methods in, in great detail, which I, I think the labs found to be um, excruciatingly annoying. Let me just let's put it that way. We used <laughs> um, that was some, I, I, every, I would have to say everybody recognized how useful it would be, and everybody hated it, in, including us. Okay. Um, it does pay off. I'll show you how it pays off. Um, we use controlled vocabularies as much as possible so that when, for example, we're describing, uh, a lab is describing a microdissected tissue, um, they're, able to, uh, they're able to pick from a, uh, a controlled vocabulary, in, case, in this case, controlled vocabulary, the worm anatomy, uh, the tissue that they, are, that they were selecting. So we tried to make it easy by doing that and form some uniformity. Okay, and, and then for each submission, we need to, so we've broken the protocol up into these, into each, into these 10 or 20 different wiki pages. We have to show how they're, how they're put together to make a complete materials and methods for that experiment. So we came up with this thing called BIRTAB, Biological Information Resource or something like that. I've forgotten even what the abbreviation means which is basically an Excel spreadsheet in which um, you list uh, uh, each step of your protocol and you explain uh, how the various, uh, explain the, the sequence of events. And I'm not going to lead you through this thing because it'll take at least 20 minutes. But this, this particular bird tab is describing a, uh, a, a chip seek experiment and they're, they're, they're providing links here to wiki pages where they're talking about how they, uh, uh, how they grow the organism, more links for the chromatin extraction, uh, additional lines to describe the, the biological replicates, the sequencing steps, the dry lab steps, the peak calling, and every time they generate an intermediate data file, um, we have them appended to their submission, and, and everything's mapped together in this, in this format. And this, again, was quite excruciating. But what it allows us to do is when we go to publish the data, we can actually pick everything together and put it into this nice human-readable format in which has each step, one after the other, uh, a brief description, and then links into the wiki page. So for a particular result, you can go back and see every step that was done and what the results, what the results were and understand how it was done. <laughs> Both at the draw, both the dry steps and the wet steps. Okay, and then we have a. Uh, this is uh, essentially this the the same thing, but in even more excruciating detail, where I've where we've gone down to individual um, uh, chip files from a from a tiling from a tiling array. Okay, um, to to make it easy, in theory, for the groups to upload their data, we created this uh, interactive uh, submission page. And basically, it's uh, steps which allow them to, to uh, upload, uh, to, to name a new, a new experiment, upload data to it. Um, it gives them access to the genome browser. They can uh, configure the tracks themselves, run the QC steps. And at the end, they get all the way to the end of this. And it gets accepted for, pub it gets accepted for publication. And I'm not, it's, it's actually interactive. You click on things, and, and there are pop-ups, and so on. Uh, and then we publish the data in a variety of a variety of ways. Uh, the raw sequence data went, and uh, uh, tiling array data went to the gene expression uh, omnibus geo. We publish the data as uh, uh, to a uh, an ad hoc um, data mining database called ModMine, uh, my collaborator Goss Micklem's project at University of Cambridge. We have raw downloads. We have a genome browser, of course, not as nice as Savant. And we also publish the data to, the, uh, to Amazon. 
so that people can, so that the data set lives in Amazon and people can run virtual machines against it without downloading it. Give you some idea of what these tools do. ModMine is a, uh, a, a list-based query engine where you do queries, you create lists of biological objects. You can combine them in various ways like intersecting or taking unions. So for example, you can find all annotated transcription factors and then identify uh, the uh, uh, cis regulatory sites with, which are within 1,000 base pairs at the start of that. Uh, you can then intersect it with orthologs, uh, with, with um, uh, uh, you can intersect it with uh, uh, orthologs in another organism and get a smaller list and proceed in that way. Uh, so this is an, an example here of uh, picking uh, a, li uh, a, a list of worm transcription factors that somebody cre somebody created. Yeah. Uh, then you can do simple analyses on it. So what's its distribution across the chromosome? Oh, isn't this interesting? I have much less, uh, much fewer transcription factors on chromosome four and many more on chromosome five than I expect. Uh, and you can do more advanced operations on it like um, uh, combining it with expression data and creating and doing hierarchical clustering on the fly. Uh, via cell line or developmental stage in this example. And then there's the, uh, 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 the display that I showed before where you have the, the, the uh, transcription factor network browser. Uh, the genome browser is, uh, uh, is, is based on the, the GBrowse uh, model organism browser that we developed for WormBase. It's uh, 10 year old technology at this point, but it, it, does the, it does the job. We created some specialized displays for ChipSeq. We added a few features which let you, with one click, download uh, all the data from a track, which people had requested. Uh, and we added support for next generation sequencing data. So you can go down to the individual bases, you can look at variants, and so on. Okay. Uh, what, one thing that I like, really liked is we, we, had, uh, several, we have several thousand data file downloads and it's very difficult to organize that in an FTP site in a way that makes sense to everybody. So we took our queue from uh, Best Buy and created a shopping cart sort of thing where uh, the, uh, when you go to the FTP site, what you get is this download browser, faceted download browser. On the left-hand side are a series of metadata fields that you can select, select amongst. The organism, the type of experiment, the genomic target element, the technique it's used, the principal investigator, the developmental stage, the mutants, the cell line, and you select one or more checkboxes and as you do so, the list of experiments gets smaller and smaller so that until you have honed in on what you want. You can also just do a text search. And so in this example, I'm looking for C. elegans, transcription factor binding sites for AMA1 and DUMP27 and PHA4, and I'm interested in embryos. So I clicked off early embryos and embryos. It found four, um, uh, four data sets that I can look at. I put in my shopping list these three, and now I can browse them in the, uh, in, in the Gene browser. I can download them. Uh, or I can, in fact, get a list of Amazon cloud files, which will take me to a virtual machine where I can now mount them onto my virtual disk and start working with them uh, or view them in ModMine. So this is kind of a fun and very popular feature. And lastly, uh, because it is a large data set um, and it's inconvenient to move to your own, to your own machine, uh, you, if you just want to take a, a quick look-see at it, you can go to the to the Amazon. You can go to Amazon and attach a volume that has all the data on it to your virtual machine, and start working with it. Um, play with it for as long as you like. You can make a cluster of a hundred machines and do some parallel computation over it, or just work on it for five minutes and then shut the thing down, and you you don't pay more than cents on it. Data set was is is currently public. It's on Amazon. This is the data set from. Um, uh, uh, earlier this year, it's five terabytes uh, at that point, and it's, uh, we're about to release a new version, which is about double that size. Okay, so now we get to uh, the not so the not so good. So there's this is lessons learned. So one of the things we learned is that it it, it um, is that it's uh, 
submissions are spiky and it's hard to keep up with them. What we're looking at here is the cumulative number of, uh, uh, of submitted uh, data sets through the end of the fourth year. The number that we curated and released, and you can see there's always a gap, and sometimes it's, bad, it's big, and sometimes we've almost caught up, but never quite. And down here is the week by week number of submissions that we got. And you can see that it's not a, a constant rate that we could deal with, but in fact, it's sometimes it's near zero, and then suddenly it jumps, it jumps up. And these correspond to, uh, to workshops and publication freezes, and uh, when we would announce a freeze for publication, suddenly on uh, uh, five minutes before midnight on the deadline, we would, we would be flooded with submissions, and we'd fall behind. And what really doesn't help is, is, <laughs> uh, is hardware and software failures. We actually had two of these, a major one here, and you can see that right after the publication freeze, which is probably the worst time for it to happen, we were essentially dead in the water because our whole RAID system uh, crashed and was unrecoverable. And it was that point we discovered that the tape backups hadn't been working. <laughs> And uh, we, uh, we basically uh, spent three months uh, putting the data together. Fortunately, it wasn't all stored in one place, but it was stored in a zillion different places. And uh, about 20 of the data sets we didn't recover. And, and the laboratories, fortunately, had copies that they hadn't deleted. So we didn't, but that was very embarrassing. And then later on, not shown here, we had a, a several weeks of outage uh, when uh, we had a, a database replication error where we had a master server uh, or master slave database replication system and uh, the machine rebooted for some reason and both machines thought they were the master for a while and started writing to, to each other. So redundancy is good, Engi engineering is good. Um, we would have been more redundant if we'd gotten the budget we asked for, but it, it really is, is our fault. So that's one bad thing. Another thing um, is uh, during a, sort of uh, three years into the project, uh, we had, in, in order to, uh, in order to uh, be, not, be kind of nice and to, to, to play in a normalized world, we'd actually asked, uh, uh, set up the set things up so that the groups submitted their raw data directly to the SRA, their raw sequencing data directly to the SRA, so they would go into the short read archive. And when they submitted, not to give us the data files, but to give us the URL for where they had the, the accession I number. And this would enable us to pull the data in from SRA as we needed it, not to have big files being uploaded to our servers. Um, and um, it also ensured that all the data was going into SRA, which otherwise it wouldn't do. Well, about halfway through the project, we got a little announcement that SRA is shutting down. Uh, as it happened, this never actually happened. But because we thought it was happening, we went into panic mode, and we started copying everything over in, onto our local servers, had to buy new storage to do this. And it was a, a major, major distraction and effort. And so don't, don't trust those people at, uh, uh, in Washington or in Bethesda, I guess. Here's another thing that I'm not ash too ashamed to admit. Our genome browser, which worked great on Wormbase and Flybase, did not work great when the data became an order of magnitude larger. And to this day, if you try to look at, at, at too much data at once, you get these error messages, track rendering error, timeout, try, try turning off tracks or looking at a smaller region. That shouldn't, that shouldn't happen. And in, uh, in retrospect, we'd either have gone with a different browser, it wasn't any appropriate one at the time, but there are now, uh, or we would have put, uh, had an, an, a, a hired, uh, a software, a full-time software engineer to look after it. I know I'm running over. Oh, not too bad. Okay. And now we get to the UG, uh, the ugly. So the, the, the genome browser was under-engineered 
our submission system was over-engineered. Too, uh, you know, too many, too many options, too many buttons to press. You could configure things all you liked, but it was a largely, uh, it was a process where you clicked on a, you, you, you clicked on the next step. You waited it for it to complete. You came, you got a coffee. You came back. You clicked on the next one, and the, uh, and uh, all what the sub experimental groups wanted to do. They wanted to upload their data to the FTP site and then forget it and move on to the next thing. They did not want to uh, babysit the process. Now, the, we did this for a reason. We did it because we knew from experience that most submissions would fail on the first go round. They wouldn't be formatted correctly. They'd be missing something. There'd be problems. They'd be check the checksums wouldn't match, et cetera. And rather than have a turnaround where we came back to the groups after a week or two and said, "Oh, we've gotten to look, we've looked at your file, at your submission, and you're missing something. Please resubmit." We said, "Okay, we're going to have them do it, and they're going to they're going to curate it themselves." Never worked. A disaster. We ended up we ended up uh, baby, babysitting the process. So we ended up with you know we ended up with a a very pretty submission system, which, which we hand curated through. Man. The birds have format, wonderful in concept, horrendous in implementation. Uh, the, it, it's supposed to be friendly because you can create it with Microsoft Excel. The, the, the problem is that um, you actually need a degree in computer science to, to create them correctly formatted. And by so, each, in, in each of the submitting labs, there was a bioinformatician who was assigned to do data submission. That was their job. Now, usually, in fact, they were doing 10% data submission and 90% data analysis, and they didn't like to do the data submissions, but that's a different story. But it's easy to say that, the, that um, no matter how many templates we created and led through and how many tutorials we did, these folks were just baffled. And we would provide a template with a worked example. And, and, and what we would get is they would submit the worked example to us multiple times and wouldn't know how to change it to reflect the actual experiment. We ended up, in, in many cases, filling out these bird tabs ourselves. And this just slowed down the whole process. So I advise, if you ever want to do this, which I strongly advise you not to, um, is uh, 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 spend the time to um, spend the time to create some other structured way, some more natural looking, maybe graphical way of describing submissions. Maybe, you know, this is, actually does have a graphical representation. Maybe if we had created something which lets you create a flowchart, people would have liked doing it. I'm actually dubious about even that. Uh, and then lastly, Quality control, a major selling point of the modern code project, is that there were uniform quality control standards for RNA sequencing experiments, chromatin IP, small RNA sequencing experiments, and everything was agreed to by committee and uniformly applied across the project. Now, and here's an example of a of uh, of uh, actually a a, 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 a uh, submitted paper describing the, uh, the quality control standards for, for ChipSeq um, on mod encode and, and encode. And there are similar papers or, or, and documents for each of the protocols, which specify how the antibodies are to be, is to be tested and qualified, how deeply, how you do the chromatin IP, how you test the chromatin IP has worked, how deeply you do the sequencing. Uh, in, in great detail, such as depth of coverage, percent of aligned bases, error rate, and so on. Um, quality control standards, are, however, are no good if they're introduced at the end of the project rather than at the beginning. So this was from three years into the project. The committee finally decided what the quality control standards were. And during the process, the representative of the DCC would said, well, this is great, but you know if we actually apply these, all your submissions are going to fail. 
Um, and they said, well, we know that, we know that, we'll redo them. And so D-Day came, and we turned on the automatic QC checks. And all the submissions failed. And suddenly there was no data left. And, and it was things like, and it was, I'm not saying that the data is bad, but the quality control standards were unrealistic. So for um, chromatin IP, for example, there is a requirement that if you did the, uh, if you um, were, were using the antibody to do chromatin immunoprecipitation in embryo, you would have to do a Western blot to show that it would work in embryo. If you then go to do it in adult, you have to do a Western blot to show that it works in adult as well. You had to qualify it, test it in each stage. Well, nobody had done that. Nobody was willing to do that. It shouldn't have gone into the quality control standards. So instead, what we did is we created a little checkbox for the PI that says, I approve this submission. I waive it. And, and down at the bottom of this is a little paragraph saying, um, the, the PI, if he has other information that the antibody is good, may waive these requirements. So every single, almost every single antibody, with a few exceptions, is, is actually waived. I don't think it affects it, but it's, unreali but it's unrealistic. And it, it caused, actually, as you can imagine, friction between the DCC and the, submit and the submitters. Um, so you know, in summary, Modern Code Project is a learning experience for me. The good part is that the science is, the science is excellent. We've created a lasting legacy community resource. Um, we actually have a, a path for keeping the, keeping the data um, uh, good for, the, for, the, the, for, the, uh, uh, for a long, long time by storing all the resources, the web servers, the databases, the uh, browser as virtual machines and virtual images in Amazon Cloud, such that anybody can go back to it and relaunch the, uh, relaunch the, 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 the website and the databases in the future. Uh, the data is also going, of course, into the model organism databases. So it's, uh, it'll be online as well. And more good stuff is coming at the end of the year. Um, watch, uh, you know, uh, watch your local, your local journal. Um, the bad is um, that it's very easy to underestimate um, the manpower, software, and hardware needs for a project of this, uh, of this magnitude. We under-engineered uh, where we shouldn't. Uh, we did not plan for the, un for the unexpected, such as the changes in the SRA. SRA. And, and then finally, uh, in projects of this sort, um, social engineering um, and, and human factors engineering is absolutely as important as the software engineering. Uh, and we should have put more attention to uh, uh, to the, the human proce human processes. Uh, and uh, if we had structured the DCC lab relationships better, perhaps by embedding members of the DCC in the labs to do the data submissions, of course, it would have increased the budget, but it would have been worth it. Uh, I think we could have made the whole process a lot smoother. And uh, finally. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the Data Coordinating Center is a multi as an international effort with uh, participants from uh, Lawrence Berkeley under Susie Lewis, uh, the University of Cambridge under Goss Micklem, and, and my group at the OICR, uh, Peter Rusinoff, uh, Mark Perry, Kwong Trin, and, and Zheng Zha, many of whom are here today. Thanks. Today I was listening to a Nature podcast and there was an interview with uh, Newton Bernie yeah. about the ENCODE project. Yeah. And their last question to him, sort of, you know, sort of answered it already, but if you had to do this over again, yeah. what, what thing, what's the big thing you would change apart from the, say, the, the relationship between the labs and the embedding? And, and, uh, how, would you, how would you instruct, let's say, maybe the grantee agency to organize a better way from the way it's been done? Uh, for ENCODE or MonEncode? Well, the, the, so, yeah, MonEncode had a few structural problems at the beginning. And one of them was that there was no analysis working group, or there was no, there was no funded uh, analysis, data analysis group. 
and that was that was just a clear mistake for the funding agency. They under I think they they uh, they uh, under uh, underfunded the, uh, um, uh, the 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 data collection, not just from the DCC but also from the labs. They they cut the informatics budget from each of the labs. Um, so that they had, each lab basically had one person who was doing both analysis and data submission, and each of those is a full-time job or, or, or more. And so that, that, that's actually intended to be a junior person too. And so that, that was really part of, part of the core problem. If I were to do it, if I were to do it again, I would have spent, uh, first of all, I would have simplified the submission process considerably. considerably. Uh, and automated it more. I think we, we should have done a, you know, a, kind of an email system where you upload and then you get a, a letter, an automatic letter a day later that says yes it worked or no it didn't. You know, and then let them do it that way rather than have the interactive form. Um, and I would have relaxed the metadata metadata requirements and collected less. But wouldn't that have sort of come with the problem downstream with respect to trying to integrate things from different labs? In the wrong format or? Well, and for trading, we're trading off detail of collection with against a accuracy and completeness. So I think that because this, because we we asked for a lot, we we actually ended up getting getting uh, 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 getting partial data in many cases, and people filling things in with whatever because they couldn't be bothered to do it in detail. So I think the uh, the perfection was the enemy of the good. I, I, yeah, it's 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 case it's case by case. The so, um, you know, downstream of everything else, the analysis is the ultimate quality control. So if the uh, so and, and you know before the before the analytic results were published, everything went through actually very stringent statistical based uh, testing of reprodu of reproducibility levels of noise levels of coverage and you can't uh, you can't hide you can't hide that that's very good what happened of course is that um, uh, you know that step caught a lot of things that went that that had gone that had gone through um, and uh, the QC that was applied too late because and I want to emphasize it's not the DCC creating the QC rules but the the laboratories themselves in committee deciding what their QC should be, um, they had failed to agree, uh, reach agreement in time for it to make much of a difference. And so we had very basic QC tests at the DCC. When we tried to put the more advanced ones in, it would cause too much pain. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to invite you all to thank you for a great talk and follow up.